Good evening. I wow, look at all the people who are here. <laughs> this is fantastic. That's great. Uh, you know, sometimes after, after a day's work, some inertia sets in, and maybe you just want to stay home, but no, you're out and doing, and that's great. I'm Kate Butler, and I'm one of the organizers of the Old Town Poetry Series, and tonight is a bonus program in our monthly series. John Beck, who coordinates Our Daily Work, Our Daily Lives, a labor history program in the MSU School of Labor and Industrial Relations, contacted Rulaine Stokes, who is our chief organizer, to ask whether we would host a poetry reading by Susan Eisenberg, and we didn't hesitate for a heartbeat to say, yes, 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 we'll, we'll make that happen. Now, as I mentioned, this is a bonus program. Next Wednesday, at the same time, is our regular program, so I'm going to take advantage of this huge audience here to plug next week's program. Uh, so February 8th, door op doors open at 7, program at 7.30. Um, it's an open mic reading, but it's an open mic with a little bit of a twist. Our open mics often have themes. Our January theme in honor of the Mayan calendar was poetry about the end of the world. Uh, our, our open mic for next week doesn't have a topical theme. It has a sort of like a homework assignment, I suppose. We're calling it Poetry Plus. So you read your poem, but there has to be a plus, an added element. Music, a prop, a costume, a puppet, you know, whatever uh, plus you would like to add. So if you don't want to participate but would like to hear Poetry Plus, please join us in a week. If you would like to participate and read a poem, Plus, please do. And in fact, if you're interested, let me know because we're trying to get a head count going on how many people we think are, are going to be performing. And the other thing that may be different from some other sort of open mic series is you don't have to read your poetry. A lot of people get up and perform a poem by someone they admire. They just love this poem and they want other people to hear this poem. And they get up and read someone else's poem. Copyright law be damned. We do it anyway. Um, so, so please... Next week, doors open at 7, uh, poetry reading starts at 7.30, Poetry Plus, to watch or to participate, we'd love to have you here. So, on to tonight's business. First of all, we have to do the thank yous. There are people who make it possible to pull this off. One is Ina Busby, the owner of the Creole Gallery, and the other crucial person is Hanno Meingas back there, who takes care of the... Yeah does the sound and does the lights and just takes care of us here and without him it doesn't happen. The other special, special thanks go to Anne Francis and her huge crew of volunteers. Um, oh my gosh! I mean, to say that the Old Town Poets are hosting this is basically to say that I'm getting up and making this introduction. Uh, because they took care of everything, and I kind of paced around looking like I was being helpful. Uh, they have a really great crew here. Another important thing to know is at the table back there, first of all, there's all sorts of interesting networking information from women in the trades, but there are also books by our poet Susan Eisenberg for sale back there at that table, so we hope that you will take advantage there are refreshments from the wonderful crew of volunteers back there. Cookies and fruit and juice and sparkling water and all sorts of great stuff. The next important thing you need to know in case you have not found it for yourself, that doorway leads to the restrooms. And then they are back that way through that doorway. So that's where the restrooms are. Okay, now I'm going to hand off to John Beck for a moment who is going to talk to you a little bit about our daily work, our daily lives. And now I'm going to come back and introduce the rest of the events. Our daily work, our daily lives at Michigan State is actually a cooperative adventure between the MSU Museum, the traditional arts program, and the labor education program of the School of Human Resources and Labor Relations. I direct the labor education program and I'm also an adjunct curator at the museum. For nearly 20 years now at Michigan State, our daily work and our daily lives has explored the intersection of culture and work broadly defined. We've done that through exhibits, in fact, some are right in this space. We've done it through concerts, film openings, uh, poetry and fiction readings, and we're in the 17th year of our brown bag series, many of whom of you are on our emailing list. And I'm going to start this handy-dandy yellow pad around, and if anybody wants to be on our 
uh, emailing list, please put down your name and email address. Because we believe that the intersection of culture and work is extremely important. That many times, tradeswomen are laboring every single day, but it isn't only the fact that they're unbelievably skilled at what they do with their hands, it's what they're doing with their minds at the same time, whether it's writing poetry, writing fiction, going home and doing art, whether or not it's simply about the way that they talk to each other, about the way that they talk to others, the way they represent themselves. The intersection of work and culture is about the food we eat, it's about the words we use, it's about the words we don't use, it's about calling ourselves brothers and sisters. It's not only about the labor movement, it's also about all working people. As we would say these days, the 99%. <laughs> so we hope that you'll come out to the rest of the uh, opportunities to interact with Susan. The exhibit uh, on equal terms opens at the MSU Museum and will be open through the middle of May starting this Sunday. That opening is at 3 o'clock. Now, for the uninitiated, that happens to be Super Bowl Sunday, but that's okay <laughs> because of the fact that in reality the Super Bowl starts hours later. So we'll take uh, all of you time and attention at the museum for the opening first. But then on Monday, Susan will be doing a presentation at the museum from 12.15 to 1.30, again on the exhibit and on the experience really of putting the exhibit together and all of her work uh, all of these uh, long years, uh, both in the trades as a poet and everything else that you're going to hear about in, in a few moments. We value your participation. All of our programs on campus and across the city and across the state and nation, and frankly right now we have an, a, a visiting exhibit in South Africa from the MSU Museum from our work. All of that is only possible because people like you continue to support it by coming out. We think work is important, we think culture is important, we think that intersection is important, and we think that you are important because you too work and labor every day and make the world better through, through that time and through that effort and through your creative spirit. So with that, let me hand around the yellow pad, keep it going, and I'll pick it up later somewhere at the end. And we look forward to future opportunities to work with the Old Town Poets and all the other people that we cooperate here in town with our daily work, our daily lives. Thank you so much. So this is kind of like the Academy Awards because now I'm going to introduce someone who's going to make an introduction. So it's kind of that layered kind of thing going on. Rulaine said, you know, give a little bio info on Anne Francis before she introduces Susan Eisenberg. And <laughs> But you see, good because you're applauding is going is, is sort of about what I'm about to say. But as I stood here before we started, and so I'm like, this room knows who Anne Francis is. <laughs> you know, I'm not sure Anne Francis needs an introduction, but I am Rulane's lieutenant, and I am following orders. Uh, Anne's background, as you all know, makes her the perfect person to guide us through this evening with this evening's themes. After college in the Peace Corps, Anne taught in an alternative education program, and she decided that to be a good vocational education teacher, she should be a tradeswoman herself. And she worked on the line at Oldsmobile, and she became a pipe fitter, and later she became a technical instructor in the UAW GM apprentice program and developed programs to recruit and train women and minorities for the skilled trades. She's retired now, but still very much a local activist, and there's a really good picture of her online participating in Occupy Lansing. So, Anne, I pass the hosting baton to you. I'm very excited, and I think that all of us who are in the room here tonight, we represent so many pieces of our great community. And um, I'm, I think that you will be very happy that you came tonight. Um, the thank yous, um, I, I, I think that most of all we need to include Rulane in the list of organizers for this event because even though um, she isn't able to be here because she broke her ankle and so just send her a lot of energy. She keeps that really under wraps, um, so to speak. But, but uh, she very much wanted to be here and she you know, is our press person and she does such a magnificent job of getting the word out in the community. So, Rulane, we, we're thinking about you. 
So I wrote down some things, and I will read most of them and then maybe do a little add-on. So Rulaine and I got a call from John, wherever John went, and uh, Rulaine got the call, and then Rulaine called me and said, "Have you, you know, do you know Susan Eisenberg? And I said, oh, yeah, I know Susan Eisenberg. And uh, she said, well, do you think that we should have her at the Creole? And I said, absolutely. This is a person that um, needs to be here, and we so appreciate that she could come. And um, when we talked about having Susan here at the Creole, um, we really wanted to honor her because she has quite a resume and did a lot for pioneering women and still continues that work. But we also talked about how many women in our very own community had done pioneering work and are still out there doing this work. And that what a wonderful opportunity this would be to not only honor Susan, but honor these women and also to recognize the women that are doing the work today. So that's why we're here tonight is to say thank you to Susan, but also to the tradeswomen. Um, and to, I, I came up with a new word. I'm calling them tool women now because <laughs> we have a lot of tool women in our community. And I think this uh, talks to our real longing for independence and being able to support ourselves. Um, so I just want to give a little background. There are some people I invited to this. I said, if you want to know about a piece of my life you probably don't know about, maybe you ought to come to this reading tonight. And so I know there's a few of you in the audience. And so this is a part of my history and several women's history in this room. In the mid-1970s, some women in Lansing started a group. We called it WIST, Women in the Skilled Trades. Over a 10-year period, we grew to about 40 women. There were women in the group from the State of Michigan Department of Labor, Pat Kern, I think those who were there will remember Pat, we have to bow to her. There was an electrical instructor from Lansing Community College, Deanna Haneski. There were a few women who were in apprenticeships in the construction trades and at Oldsmobile. There was a woman who was a plumber who owned a private business. There were women and lesbians who wanted to work with tools and were also looking for well-paying jobs with benefits. And there was a core of women that wanted to recruit women to the trades. One of the main goals of WIS was to support women getting into the trades in both construction trades and in manufacturing skilled trades. We filed lawsuits. We spoke and organized at the YWCA Career Days. We worked with tools, building pole barns and putting up fences. We went to conferences. We networked across the country. We went to Chicago, to Ohio, to San Francisco, to Pittsburgh, to, I can't remember where else. And most importantly, we supported one another in finding apprenticeships and getting through them. For most of the women in the trades, either for a long time or for a short time, trades was a mixed blessing and for some not a blessing at all. Our journeys were all different and almost too much to explain for those who did not do this work. And that is why it is so good to be together tonight to hear from Susan, who is a tradeswoman herself, an organizer of women in the trades, an advocate, and also committed to sharing those stories with the public so more people will know and understand. Bef but I wanted to do this before we start tonight, but before so Susan begins, and I want to tell you a little bit more about her. I want to recognize some of the early pioneers from the Lansing area and also um, and introduce them. Um, and then after the program, we are also going to have some time to network. So um, I hope I don't miss anybody, but uh, this group that I just talked about, the women in the skilled trades group, um, they are here. And I I hate to do this, but maybe we won't do it this way, but I like to do it this way. Chris McBride, she's standing in the back, <laughs> and she's there. Um, and Chris and Susan Walker, who couldn't be here tonight, uh, and myself, we we were kind of out there marching around with a whole bunch of other women, but Chris has done so much that, you know, her resume is probably as long as Susan's. 
and um, she is, she was a wonderful advocate and still works with tools and is a potter and lots of things. The other person I wanted to raise up is Daria. Where are you, Daria? Daria is right here. Stand up, Daria. Another person that you should know about is Alicia, and I, this, the lights are, there's Alicia. And Alicia, Alicia is a pioneer, and she continues in, in this work, so uh, she was there with the WISC group. And Billy, where's Billy? Billy's right here. She's a... <laughs> Billy was a millwright at Oldsmobile, and... Earlier that, huh? <laughs> she was one of the ones that she didn't stay that long, but she that was a lot of good reasons, and she supported so many of us. So let's see, who else did I want to raise up in this group? Okay, and then, um, all right, Lynn Schaefer, Carolyn Schaefer. Okay, now she might think this is a, an unusual f- compliment, but. Um, <laughs> And she was not, I don't know if you were around with the early group, but you certainly have been around. And why I point out, (laughs) why I point out Lynn is for this very reason. Like one of the reasons of the five women that I pointed out, and I know some of the rest of you have done this, is not only did they do the work, they were organizers, and they also were teachers. And Lynn, um, did things here with working women artists, but she is one of the leaders of crews at the Michigan Women's Music Festival. And um, this was a, such a huge opportunity for women who wanted to work with tools. And year after year after year, and I think there's other women, Jean, I th- saw in the audience, I think there, there's other women in the audience who did this, but that work made it possible for women to learn the skills and to, to work with other women, which you don't get to do too much in the regular trades. Thank so, you. yeah, so thank you. Okay. Um, and I, I think I, I hope I'm not overlooking too many people. I thought one of the things that would be really great is if all the, if you consider yourself a tradeswoman or a tool woman, if you would just stand up right now. And now I'll name you if you, yeah. (laughs) Okay. Um, All right, and then the last sentence I had on here is just tonight, I just feel like this is not only a way to honor our past, but also this is an opportunity for us to to embrace that, love each other, but also I think we're here and we really care about the next generation. And that's, again, why Susan's work is so important, is that next generation. Okay, so this is Susan. And um, Susan Eisenberg, she's a multidisciplinary artist and educator. She reimagines the everyday playing with scale and juxtaposition to investigate issues of power and social policy. She is a resident artist scholar at the Women's Studies Research Center at Brandeis University, where she focuses on projects that address patient-centered medical care and employment equity. She has developed two touring exhibits, which you can visit, the photographs and poems of perpetual care and the mixed media installation on equal terms. First introduced to the craft of poetry by Denise Levertoff, Eisenberg holds a BA in Women's Studies from the University of Michigan and an MFA in Creative Writing from the Program for Writers at Warren Wilson College. Eisenberg entered the construction industry in 1978, Mm, a good year for women, Mm -hmm. graduating four years later as one of the first women in the country to achieve journey-level status in the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. She earned her master's electrician's license in 1983 and worked on Boston area construction sites for 15 years, including during pregnancies with her daughter and son. 
In 1991, she began to interview other tradeswomen pioneers from across the United States. These oral histories became the basis for her nonfiction book, which you will be able to purchase. We'll call you if we need you, Experiences of Women Working Construction. It's a wonderful oral history. Um, and then I'm just going to go on here a little bit. As a poet, artist, activist, author, and lecturer, Eisenberg helped shape the cultural expression and analytical thinking of tradeswomen movement nationally and internationally. And many of us met Susan when we went to these conferences and were as inspired then, and I think we'll be inspired going forth. Um, in the 1970s and 80s, Eisenberg was artistic director of Word of Mouth Productions. I love that. A touring women's theater company, and then for 10 years, directed Women in History, a performance workshop combining theater and oral history at Boston Public Library. So that's a little bit of Susan. On her website, she has this uh, phrase when you open to this bio, art that opens conversation. And when John called Rulane, and Rulane called me, and then I started notifying tradeswomen, it opened up a conversation that many of us have not had for a very long time. And so we welcome you tonight. We look forward to what you have to share with us, and um, may we keep the conversation going. Thank you. Susan. I'll try to live up to some of that uh, introduction. Um, it's really wonderful. to. I'm from Cleveland originally, so it's um, you know really nice to get a chance to be back in the Midwest and um, especially excited to bring the Unequal Terms installation out here and um, to be here for the reading. So um, I'm going to jump around and... Um, but... Um, I want to jump around in what I'm reading. <laughs> um, Okay, and um, I thought I would just start with a couple of poems that um, people will mention the um, Occupy. We, uh, so we had Occupy Boston, and we had uh, poetry readings there, the Occupoets. Um, so I thought I would read a few of those, the poem, what I read there. Um, um, so the first poem is um, on that page. Um, <laughs> Oh, I'm looking in the wrong book. That's why. Okay. <laughs> um, um, it's a poem about the um, uh, Lowell, Massachusetts, so the, the women who worked in Lowell, Massachusetts, who were really the first women, the first people who worked for corporate America um, were the, the mills um, in Lowell. Um, and there's a wonderful uh, National History Museum or National Park there, if you ever get there, uh, with you can see the museum, the uh, factories, and the boarding houses. So you really can get a little a feel of what's there, uh, what what that experience was. And what struck me when I went there was on on the top of every mill was a giant bell, um, and that really <laughs> it just chilled me. So this poem <laughs> comes comes from that. Um, Bells of Lowell, 1836. Sleep cut open each morning by clangs of the mill bell, her teeth ache with each reverberation. All day bells, bells to work in the darkness, bells to breakfast, bonnets kept on because, oh, I'm sorry, let me just start again. Um, bells of Lowell, 1836. Sleep cut open each morning by clangs of the mill bell, her teeth ache with each reverberation. All day bells, bells to work in the darkness, bells to breakfast, bonnets kept on because quickly again, bells. Back to the machines with their loud tuka 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 dust thick as the threads they spin. Dinner bell, her mouth filling like a dog's with saliva. She rushes with the others to her place at table, cannot understand Luanda's words, asks her to repeat, but another bell. Everyone stands, still chewing bites of fried pie. Again, the machines. This, the longest stretch, standing. Her legs like numb stalks, rooting her to the oily floor. Twice more bells for supper and bedtime. Unless in her sleep she wakes in a sweat, even in her dreams some nights. Bells. 
Sunday tourists who gawk at the factory girls, how she wishes they could feel the clapper in their bones. Oh, to awaken to the sun's breath, the murmur of animals or her mother's voice at hearth. Um, and, um, and then um, I wrote this when I was working at the Heinz Convention Center um, in Boston. And what struck me, you know, as a construction worker, I think I had, uh, we were talking a little bit at dinner about all the naive ideas we had <laughs> before we went into construction. But I think I, I kind of had thought things like, oh, when women become plumbers, there'll be more women bathrooms at this and that. You know, like, <laughs> I didn't quite really get it. Um, <laughs> um, following the blueprints. To the open possibility of steel against sky, we weld, bolt, and strap wide staircases of marble, arched skylights, commanding views, serviced by windowless corridors where ceilings hang low as though the ones who will push carts or carry trays are unusually small or prefer to scurry like mice in closed dark spaces or as though extra headroom might give them ideas. <laughs> like I realized you could know, if you knew how to read blueprints, you could tell in any part of the building what the class of the people using that part of the building would be. It was kind of a eye-opening. Um, and, um, well, I'll read a few poems about health issues. Um, so I have lupus, which is an autoimmune disease. Ninety percent um, the people who have it are women, and it's an autoimmune disease that um, can affect your organs. Um, and um, um, at this time, I, when I was writing this poem, I also had um, thyroid cancer, so I was like kind of a, in the heart of the medical uh, industry. Um, and um, this was right around. Uh, if you remember the. Um, shortage of flu vaccine year. Um, so this was around that time, and it was also right around the time when um, George Bush was either reelected or elected the first time, depending on your, you know, your point of view about that. Um, <laughs> and that right after that election, when was there, a, there was a, a, a big bombing in Iraq um, that followed that. So this kind of pulls all those things together in a way. Um, flu vaccine. Because I have been persistent, and aggressive, because I've been chumsy, chatty, and charming, because I have mentioned the names of doctors Big Shot and Pooba Booba, because I have pleaded, let my voice waver at Desperation Cliff, because English is my native tongue, I know to phone this Friday morning to bypass the message that recommends I call 1-800-SPIN-YOU-IN-CIRCLES, to press 3, the live human voice, and inform said voice, I know 2,000 vials of vaccine have arrived. I present credentials, chronic this and that, upcoming danger, possible hush, don't speak its name. The human voice checks, corroborates, finds that yes, my name is on the playing grid to compete against two-year-olds, mothers with AIDS, my friend with emphysema to win most desperate 2,000. The chosen will be called, appointments made. The others, she's not sure, maybe a letter will come by mail. This same morning in Fallujah, two-year-olds, mothers with AIDS, someone's friend with emphysema, a woman like me, chronic this and that, upcoming danger, possible hush, don't speak its name, hide from election prizes tossed from the sky. All this interrupts my lessons. I am studying kindness of heart, mindfulness. I have taken a sacred vow to ban the word evil from my mouth. But words too persevere, pry open the jaw. There it is, caught between my teeth, where my tongue can't dislodge it. Um, um, and these are two poems that, um, that are from a manuscript that I think is coming out next year called Perpetual Care. Um, and uh, it's kind of about that lupus in the medical system. And um, Lupus outwits me, declares martial law. 
Who would dream to awaken from fevered sleep, stun gunned into paralysis by their own ruthless doppelganger? Power stations overtaken in a pre-dawn coup from every organ of the body, a triumphant, unfamiliar flag. Who wouldn't be humbled by their doubles' brazen brilliance or begin at once to plot in whispers the first frantic steps of resistance? Um, there always seemed to be something kind of odd about an autoimmune disease, you know, when you're attacking yourself. Um, um, and then what struck me too is like, you know, here you are when you're in the most, um, in a way, kind of vulnerable position is when these, um, you're the most attacked by the medical system, I think. Um, medical bills. White envelopes pile up in, draft, in drifts upon the desk unopened. She knows what's required the pleasing manner and persistence to clear a path through their tangle of errors and settle on a sum or face a siege of dinner time calls. Each day a relentless advance, more envelopes arrive. Through their clear windows her imprinted name peeks out. A reminder of more than the money owed, how vulnerable, how captive she's become, waiting for results, answers, a plan that will restore her own self. Um, so let me read some. Um, um, I feel like people often say to me, like, well, don't you have not, you know, good things to say about the trade? So I want to read, I'll start with a poem about, uh, I just, I mean, one thing I just always really loved is that sense of camaraderie and, and ensemble work that you really find sometimes. Um, so this is just a poem about pulling wire. Um, and the, this figure on the ladder in the, in the installation is, that's what she's doing, pulling wire. You know, so you know she has a partner somewhere. Wire talk. Working three floors apart, two mechanics at either end of a pipe, feed and pull in meter, keeping time through a Morse code of yanks and tugs fingertips against the vocal cords of wire. Um, um, and, I, and I'm going to read a couple of partner poems. So um, I started re um, realizing after a while of working in the trades that people, um, kind of characters kept reappearing, even though they had a different name and be a, kind of a different person, but they were the same person. Um, so then those became these, you know, kind of uh, nine partner poems. Um, I'll read two of them. I think this is kind of my homage to the old timers who, you know, are really a treasure on, on jobs. And, and what I found when I read these in different parts of the country, you know, everybody knew the same person. Partner number one. It was him and men like him refashioned that skyline, a remnant for more colorful days when everyone answered to a name like the Buzzard or Brownwater or Stinky or Dr. Doom. Days more difficult than these when the work was done all by hand and it was not so easy a girl could do it. More dangerous days when you saw men flatten like pancakes fried like chickens, sailing like kites to their death, and no one came out to check on why. <laughs> Reduced now to the easier task, save for old timers and the partners no one else will accept. His eyesight no match for tiny print on a motor nameplate. He growls and hisses and shoves a lifetime of lessons on any student willing. Gold, fool's gold, pebbles, bundled together in one sack. Um, this is, might also be a familiar, <laughs> but less dear person. Um, partner number three. She smelled dynamite on his shirt. Men on the crew noticed nothing peculiar. She moved cautiously, lit no matches. When she turned him down for an after work drink, she heard the fuse ignite. He stopped calling her by name, just waitress, and gave his coffee order in strict detail. Bagel toasted, not grilled. Orange juice with ice. Whenever an elevator door closed, leaving them alone for a cage ride, he recounted hunting stories. Deer drenched in blood. 
Still, like his too conscious politeness or his eerily frozen smile, these were hardly sufficient evidence. He, a journeyman, she, an apprentice, for complaining out of place. The afternoon he threatened death by strangulation for the nurse and the medical director's wife, reciting their crimes so like her own as he stared into her face, the whole while throwing, retrieving, throwing, retrieving, throwing an open knife blade against a wooden ladder, staring, staring into her face as he threw the open knife. That day, she risked requesting a transfer. Um, Anne mentioned the Wakayu um, book, and um, so I'm going to read. There's two, um, I'll read two poems that come from um, those interviews, so um, that are sort of interview material in the book, but in the poetry book, <laughs> became um, sort of came into poems. Um, so. Um, um, Okay, so um, this is a poem that's um, from a story by, um, from Gloria Flowers, who's a plumber in, um, in the Cleveland area, African-American woman. Chance. For years of faithful apprenticeship, she carries their tools, swallows their contempt, and follows their advice. Roll with the punches. Go along to get along. If you want to make it in this rough business, where the best thing to say is nothing. Shit happens. Don't get mad. Not once in three years asked to join a game of gambling or chance. Not the card pool, the check pool, check poker. Not buy some chances on a carload of cheer or 50% of the take. Not even you want frozen shrimp, three bucks a pound. Don't ask questions. Until her journeyman pushes her. Flesh bouncing off concrete down pushes her down the sub-basement stairway. No one around but them two. That day, for the first time, she is offered a chance. By a chance, 357 Magnum for Raffle. She calls God over that night and the devil, quizzes them one at a time, then both at once, throwing her questions like hot coals to catch them off guard. By starting time tomorrow, she needs a confession. Who designed those choices? Roll with the punches, quit her job, gamble 357 Magnum, and who sent that raffle man? Why? Um, um, and this is one uh, that uh, came from uh, Karen Pollock, who um, was a carpenter in Kansas City. She's out in the, um, the Seattle area now. Tell me. What shall I do with the woman's hand left on the table of the radial arm saw she was not instructed how to use? It has been knocking at the window of my dreams, poking in the closet of my memory, resting on my shoulder when I come home. What shall I do with that hand seized by her co-workers and shaken like an amulet to exorcise women from their midst? It has been tearing down curtains, ringing bells, writing me notes, wearing my rings. What she said was what they would do would be to very, make sure, um, she was in the class that started in 79, which is that sort of largest class anywhere, and um, they made, made a point to let, make sure that she knew and that all the other women knew that this accident had happened, and, um, and what they said was that a broom couldn't do that to you. Um, so I'm going to read three poems together that are from um, different that have kind of, um, for, for me, kind of iconic of different points in time. What's been sort of interesting to me as somebody who's, um, you know, worked <laughs> the same material for, you know, a third of a century already, um, that the, even looking at the same point in time or experience, my 
framework, you know, kind of went from those blinders on to like wider, wider lens. And, um, you know, I find it again, you know, with this new install, re, you know, another round of doing the installation, like again, a reframing of things. Um, so this was a, a poem that I wrote when I was an apprentice. Um, and so in the installation, I actually hung these three, first the three next poems I'm going to read in with a date, because I, I just felt like they were from different eras for me. Um, hanging in solo. So what's it like to be the only female on the job? On the sunshine rainbow days, womanhood clothes me in a fuchsia velour jumpsuit and crowns me with a diamond hard hat. I flare my peacock feathers and fly through the day's work. Trombones sizzle as my drill glides through cement walls, through steel beams. Bundles of pipe rise through the air at the tilt of my thumb. <laughs> Everything I do is perfect. The female of the species advances ten spaces and takes an extra turn. On the mud-cold, gray, no sun in a weekdays, womanhood weighs me down in collarless Arctic fatigues, hands me an empty survival kit, and binds my head in an iron hard hat three sizes too small. I burrow myself mole-like into my work, but my Tampax leaks, my diamond tip bit burns out after one hole, my offsets are backwards, all of my measurements are wrong. At each mistake, a shrill siren alerts all tradesmen on the job <laughs> to come laugh at me. Everything I do must be redone. The female of the species loses her next turn and picks a penalty card. On most days, those partly sunny days that bridge the rainbow sunshine days and the mud-cold gray days. Womanhood outfits me in a flannel shirt and jeans and hands me a hard hat just like everyone else's. I go about my work like a giraffe foraging the high branches, stretching myself comfortably. As I hang lighting fixtures and make splices, I sing to myself and tell myself stories. Everything I do is competent enough. The female of the species advances one space and awaits her next turn. <laughs> so I went through a whole period at, at later on that I just hated that poem because I just felt like it was too cheerful. And, <laughs> um, um, and I wrote this next poem after I did a reading out in the Bay Area and a woman firefighter out there who had left firefighting came up to me afterwards and she was like, you know, um, if it was all that, you know, great as you make it sound in your poems, I wouldn't have left, you know. And it really married me, um, you know, deep, a lot deeper and realized, just sort of open myself to, um, well, we weren't like this sort of pioneering, like kind of in this wilderness. There were really people right next to us who could have helped us. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> just to look at it with a much, like a little bit more of a wide angle lens. And, uh, you know, it was also at a point, in, you know, in the late 80s of just really realizing there really weren't the women behind us that we thought there would be. <laughs> you know, I mean, the numbers have stayed the same since the early 80s at 2.5%. So, um, so um, and then I wrote this poem. Pioneering for the tradeswomen of 78. She had walked into their party uninvited, wedging a welcome mat in the doorway for other women she hoped would follow along soon. The loud ones argued to throw her out immediately. Even her supporters found her audacity annoying, but once they saw her, she mingled with everyone, drank American beer, kept conversations going during awkward silences, and was backed up by law, the controversy calmed. She surprised them. She was reliable. She always gave her best. She was invited back. She became a regular, always on the fringe, expected to help out just a little more. When she stopped coming, they were confused. 
Why now? Hadn't she challenged customs, stared down rumors, ingratiated herself years ago so that now her presence was only mildly discomforting? She never explained. After all those years hurling back cannonballs, womanizing the barricades, firing only if she saw the whites of their eyes, it was the lonesomeness of pioneering that broke her resistance. All those silences about what mattered most in her life had worn her, like the slow eating away of acid on metal, the damage only visible over time. Um, Um, and then this poem I've read a lot this year or this I guess last year now um, because it's, it references the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire which had its 100th anniversary um, and I thought that was just an amazing um, I, I just feel like there were so many wonderful events talking about the Triangle you know kind of what did that mean the Triangle you know the, what were the lessons from the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire and um, so I just that was great. Um, okay. Um, and then this actually, um, the the first story that gets dis, um, referenced in the in this poem is now um, kind of opened up a whole other um, piece that's now in the installation about trades women who have died, whose deaths were work related, um, that um, I've just been. Investigating around the country and kind of working with different groups of tradesmen in different places to recall that um, those histories and find the names of the women people remember um, and what happened to them. And and it's been um, always much worse what we than what people were thought had happened. <laughs> uh, so it's just been very. Um, I, I feel like I understand the word painstaking, um, and I, I just feel like, like people have been very. Um, uh, wonderful to me to, you know, kind of, because I wanted to do that to, you know, kind of really deep going into some very painful places for themselves. Um, so this is the third, you know, more recent one. Remembering the fire at Triangle Shirtwaist. Roberto in Milwaukee sizes me up then sidles over sideways like a crab, asks if I've heard about the woman iron worker from Kenosha. It's no riddle. I read his eyes. Pray he'll go mute. There are two versions to the story, he says, placing the bait. I bite, he tells. She was an apprentice, had two kids, fell from the steel, and died. They say it shows women can't handle the business, but guys fall too. He waits. I ask for the other version, the one I see itching at the soft flesh beneath his shell. She asks for a safety harness. Foreman said she didn't need one. And Seattle, the buzz about the new line women, eager to impress means easy to fatigue. Send her up and down, up and down, up, down, up the pole. Soon her arms will just let go. Or unbuckle her belt, let her test her wings. When labor at century start, bronze those bales of flaming shirtwaist girls, cascading out the ninth floor windows of ash. Was that not a covenant that the sky would stop dropping women? Um. I'm going to read this one. Um, um, this is about a woman I used to, I worked with on a, one of the last jobs I worked on, uh, Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital in Boston, uh, we used to have lunch together every day, and there were three women on the job, we'd all have lunch together. Um, and it kind of becomes my confessional <laughs> about things that I... I, I, I uh, we, we kind of got mentioned in, in, at dinner uh, of like... Um, sometimes the work in the trades made you uh, become someone that you didn't always like, you know, that you, there were parts of yourself you didn't like about um, the way you felt that you had to act. Um, so I think this is <laughs> some of that for me, too. Um, so um, there's a tile for this woman in the exhibit now. Kathy Leonard, one. 
I knew her well enough to get a phone call, and yes, that front page photo was Kathy, an iron worker, married to an iron worker. Her father filed the missing person, a neighbor wife, 12 days later, called police. Imagine how she must have begged her husband to make that call and open the hall closet to show a power saw with bits of bone, cartilage, blood splattered on the safety guard. The Milwaukee saw, saw her husband had lent to Kathy's, who the day after Kathy was last seen, loaded heavy bags into a trash truck, then returned the saw frame and a brand new 12-inch blade. Two. If the saw lender refused to rat and his friends forgot they dumped a bloodied mattress, let me tell you, it's that kind of business. We see and turn away. We're used to covering up. I'm the same. I never told about the dental clinic wall that should have been lead sheathed, but the price of scrap high after inspection, the lead was sold. Or the community financed housing where the clerk declared a hallway too narrow by half an inch, ordered carpenters to move the sheetrock wall and was pleased when he remeasured. Fool. They'd removed the firewall layer of sheetrock and to bury that deception needed me to change a faceplate. I shrugged, you know where they are, and walked away. Shrugged and walked away many times. Or maybe I'd confess to anything rather than let that murder vibrate its blade across my bone. Few crimes are solo acts. Um, I'm going to read a poem for, um, I don't know if people know, there's a case um, in, out in Oregon that was... Um, 2010, fall of 2010, a woman line worker who um, had to do a lawsuit to get her um, journey card she was, that she was being denied, um, Jenna Smith. And um, so she won it after, uh, after a lawsuit and really, and she became only the second woman in uh, Oregon to, to get a journey card in line work. Um, you know, um, High voltage line work apprentice. When the brute charged with her training, whipped her legs with a rigging chain, he was teaching indentured and choice. She'd be his chattel or she'd be run off. She kept silent about that wound, kept her job. At the skills of his trade, he was qualified, but about the world beyond his pole, ignorant couldn't figure any wrong with keeping things how they'd always worked, family. Um, does the sense of time or should... Uh, okay, so just wrap it up. Okay, so let me just read one. Um, I'm going to end with this poem. Um, I mentioned that I did theater. So when I um, first, in 1978, when I started my apprenticeship, I also did a one-woman show about Calamity Jane. Um, <laughs> and that was just so helpful for me uh, to just sort of inhabit this woman who did men's work and look at what her survival strategies were. And, and some of them were, <laughs> some of them I used myself. Uh, <laughs> I tried to learn from her. Um, anyway, so that was just a lot of a new fun. So I just thought, oh, um, I kind of, for me, I associate her a lot with that, that history for myself. So I, I'm going to end with a poem about uh, Calamity Jane. At the passing of Calamity Jane. Maybe she married the Prince of Pistols, maybe not. And the ambush story, folks here tell that lots of ways. The girl baby, I wouldn't know. You see, with hail the size of coffee cups, winter's so cold your eyeballs near froze, gold making folks jumpy as mountain goats, and craziness at times a woman's best protection. Most trails led through switchbacks of tale and truth. But whether she were mule skinner and scout or whore and drunk don't matter none. 
She'd have shared her last grub or steak with any soul luck tossed out. She loved her Satan, but when the oats was gone, she shooed him to the hills. Here's a fact. I saw it myself. She rode the most dangerous trails upside down. Head on the saddle, boots to the sky. Thank you.